consists of 15 sessions and the program is accredited with 11 continuing medical points of the European Board for Accreditation in Hematology. So if you want to get those credits, please pay attention that um, on the Zoom you have written your full name and surname in order to track your participation and also at the end of this webinar you are going to receive a survey uh, with three very easy simple questions but it's mandatory to answer in order to get the accreditation because yes it's a way to certificate your presence for us um, another technical issues before starting as you see, this session is recording, so if you don't feel comfortable about that, please put your camera off and also be kindly informed that your microphone is muted and if you have any questions, you can address them during the presentation or at the end of the presentation in the in the chat and those will be answered during the at the end of the presentation during the dedicated session. Um, so now the home rules are finished. So uh, today um, uh, with me, there is the speaker of today's session. So the professor Eric Rondo, who will lead the session on diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So uh, le pro uh, professor Rondo is a nephrologist head of the intensive care nephrology and renal transplantation at the department in the Hôpital Tenon in Paris. He's also professor of nephrology at the Sorbonne University in Paris. His clinical research activities are dedicated since more than 20 years to intensive care nephrology and especially AKI, thrombotic microangiopathy hemolytic uremic syndrome, and renal transplantation. In France, he is the co-chair of the National Reference Center for Rare Diseases, Thrombotic Microangiopathies, the CNR MAT, and he is the national coordinator of the International Registry for uh, HUS. So, Professor Rondeau, please, the floor is to you. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen now. Uh, sorry. So this is not ready. Okay. Okay. Here is. Uh, and some uh, message said that they cannot hear, but I can hear you very well. So I hope that everyone is able to hear. You do see, you do see my screen now. Yes, perfectly. Okay, and I will. Now you can put in presentation mode. Yeah. Yes. Great. Perfect. Okay. So, thank you very much for the invitations, and thank you for attending this uh, presentation. Um, my uh, topic today is the diagnosis of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. I know that you already have a session about the uh, uh, shigatoxin-induced uh, um, HUS, so I will not spend too much time on this. I know also that in your program you have um, a specific uh, topic about uh, HUS in pregnancy, and uh, so uh, I will not talk too much about it. And uh, you have a, a, a topic uh, also with the drug-induced uh, HUS. So I, I will also just mention them, but will not uh, discuss too much about them. So uh, here are my conflict of interest. And... Um, uh, the learning objective today is uh, to identify the TMA-HUS on clinical and biological science. 
to know how to perform the differential diagnosis, which is quite difficult, especially in adults more than in children, and to know the role of complement in some form of HUS, but not all form of HUS. So thrombotic microangiopathy, as you already know, are characterized, it, they, they are syndrome, and they are characterized by microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with the, the presence of uh, schistocyst, as uh, indicated here on the right side of the slide, uh, a peripheral thrombocytopenia, usually lower than uh, 150,000 per liter, per millimeter cube, sorry, but with no evidence of uh, intravascular uh, coagulation, very important point, and also organ involvement of variable severity, and especially in our case, the kidney, uh, to make the hemolytic uremic syndrome, since there is frequently a renal failure in these patients. The thrombotic microangiopathy uh, may lead to a, a constellation of symptoms that are not very specific. So sometimes the diagnosis is uh, delayed in these patients. The most important is, of course, the renal involvement with the uh, acute kidney injury. And uh, I remind you that uh, HUS is the first cause of IKI in uh, young children less than three years. And so uh, it may be associated with malignant hypertension, renal failure, and need further later uh, chronic dialysis or transplantation. The other uh, organ involved may be the central nervous system. Also, it's less important than in uh, uh, TTP. You had already some uh, presentation about TTP, so you know very well. But it also exists in HUS. So the presence of neurological sign doesn't mean or always that it is TTP. It may be a typical uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. And then we have all other organs that can be involved, gastrointestinal with the pancreatitis, colitis, diarrhea, and so on. We have uh, general signs like fatigue and so on. We have cardiovascular involvement, which are possible with myocardial infarction, thrombolism, and uh, uh, other complications. And uh, more rarely, we have a pulmonary involvement, mainly due to uh, pulmonary edema in a hypertensive patient with a renal failure. Uh, this uh, picture is very important. It is uh, uh, taken from the uh, publication of the Cadigo Conference, and uh, it indicates you the diagnostic flow chart in the presence of TMA. Probably you know already, but you have the diagnosis of TMA with the low up, uh, hemoglobin level, low platelet count. You have increased LDH, you have very low up, uh, aptoglobin, you have hemolytic, uh, uh, mechanic hemolytic anemia, and so you have to think about the TTP and measure the ADAM-TS13 activity, of course, and to look for uh, autoantibodies if you have a low level of this activity. The second uh, step is to exclude or to diagnose stack induced HUS. You already heard about it with uh, stool and swab culture and uh, Shiga toxin detection. And if you don't have low activity of that Adam TS13, you don't have a positive PCR for Shiga toxin, then you have to think about the many cases, many uh, different causes of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. They are called atypical here, but probably this is not the right classification. We prefer to talk about the primary atypical HUS here, primary atypical HUS related in 50% of the case with uh, uh, complement uh, abnormalities and overactivation of the alternative pathway. And this can be encountered uh, in the postpartum or during pregnancy. And this can be also seen in patients with 
transplantation, renal transplantation, and recurrence of the primary disease, which was uh, a typical HS, uh, on their own kidney. Uh, here, not indicated in the first classification from the Caligo, but that I think it's very important to mention is malignant hypertension because HUS can induce malignant hypertension. And so, and malignant hypertension can also mimic uh, atypical HUS with hemolytic anemia. So sometimes the diagnosis is difficult and I will discuss this uh, later, especially in adults. And uh, the other cause may are called today secondary HS or secondary TMA, uh, what they are encountered in uh, cancer, usually with uh, bone marrow metastasis, some kind of infection different from the stake infection with the virus infection and so on. After bone marrow transplantation or in case of drug induced HS, uh, or associated with autoimmune disease, pneumococcal infection with, the, uh, with a different physiopathology, and also the uh, cobalamin deficiency, uh, which uh, can uh, also mimic and uh, induce uh, HUS. So you have many causes that are mainly encountered in adults, less frequently in children. And so the, the differential diagnosis is difficult, and we will talk about this later. Uh, as I, I remind you that you already have a, a presentation about stake-induced HUS, and you will have a discussion also of drug-induced HUS, and more presently of uh, TMA during pregnancy. Uh, what are the relative percentage of uh, this different form of TMA in the usual, in you know, real life. And this is a, a, a retrospective study made about 506, 64 patients with educated TMA. And it happens that only 6% were classified as primary TMA, 3% PTT, TTP, and 3% atypical HUS. Uh, mostly with complement and abnormalities. The others were mainly secondary TMA during pregnancy, during infection, uh, after drug, uh, treat, specific drug treatment uh, associated with cancer, or in the context of transplantation, autoimmune disease, malignant hypertension, and 6% were related to shigatoxin. So, and, and in 57% of the case, uh, the, the, there were multiple causes uh, that were uncounted. So um, clearly, the, the diagnosis is very important. And this one, the uh, primary atypical HS, seems quite rare. It is a rare disease. Uh, we estimate that in France, uh, with uh, uh, 67 million inhabitants, we have around 30 new cases each year, so in children and adults, all included. So it's rare disease. It can be encountered in the pregnancy or in transplanted. So it is important to know the different pattern of expression of this disease. The treatment were variable, but you can see most of them receive eculizumab and the the, the rate of chronic dialysis was 15%, uh, cardiovascular events, neurologic complication or death. In adults, it's more than in uh, children. So uh, this disease, if we focus now on the atypical HUS, the primary form, it has been studied uh, and reported from the French court by Véronique Frambaki in 2013, about 87 children, 125 adults with the predominance of uh, female in adults and uh, uh, familial history, which can be seen here. You can see 26%, 14%. So 
uh, it's, it's sometimes in the family in, in specific families and there are triggering events such as diarrhea respiratory infection or mainly in adults pregnancy which is a very strong trigger of the disease um, in women neurological involvement if is also possible as you can see here so it's not specific of ttp and uh, uh, usually uh, renal failure is uh, very significant you can see here the mean creatinine and uh, about 60 percent of the children and 80 percent of the adults require a dialysis at the beginning for acute kidney injury the complete triad is not always presented. You see only three quarters of the patient in children and 80% of the adults have thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, and renal failure. This uh, comment was uh, published in 2014 and tried to compare it the stack induced HUS, the anti-factor H auto antibody associated HUS, and the primary or the atypical HUS with or without complement abnormalities. And you can see that roughly it's, uh, you know, it's diff difficult to know exactly at which age it appears because it can appear at any age in children. The diarrhea is more predominant in stack induced HUS, but can be encountered in patients with antifactor H antibody or with uh, complement mutation, with severe colitis, abdominal pain, uh, the, the acute renal failure is uh, almost constant in uh, antifactor H antibody HUS or in uh, those with complement abnormalities, neurological signs I already mentioned. And so, and cardiac involvement and familial history that are specific for the uh, complement uh, mutation. However, these, in this case, the, the case are not simultaneous, but if we have a small epidemic in a family, several cases can be uh, observed at the same time in a family. So, um, to make the differential diagnosis, we need uh, many uh, laboratory tests to make the diagnosis with hemoglobin, reticulocytes, and so on. We made also we need also to measure haptoglobin, which should be uh, decreased, LDH, which should be increased, increase in urea and creatinine also, and measurement of Adam TS13 to exclude TTP, and uh, this has to be done before any infusion of plasma because in the treatment of tma uh, in adults it's frequently uh, we use frequently uh, plasma and so uh, before to uh, infuse plasma we need to perform the blood test we also measure serum homocysteine to, and methionine to detect the um, uh, cobalamin c deficiency which can be uh, the uh, manifestation and uh, it can be HUS and the marker, the biological marker will be an increase in homocysteine. The microbiological analysis are also very important for the uh, stack induced HUS in stool and uh, with uh, analysis of bacteria but also PCR and uh, also serodiagnosis and to detect other viral infection that can be uh, a trigger for HUS. And more recently, several cases of um, uh, COVID infection were uh, appealed as triggers for a known atypical HUS with complement uh, variant, but also uh, lead to the discovery of uh, new patients uh, who had the uh, atypical interest during their COVID infection. So it can be uh, also uh, a new marker, or not a new marker, but uh, you know, a new triggering agent in patients with the uh, complement variant. 
The visceral involvement uh, can be uh, detected and the measurement of troponin is very important. The uh, immunological test, and especially uh, this one uh, for uh, systemic sclerosis, and uh, the serum complement can be uh, studied. Uh, the C3 level will be normal in uh, 60 to 70 percent of the case of atypical HUS, even in the case of uh, a genetic variant of the alternative pathway. If only we have a, a suspicion of atypical HUS, we go to the genetics to uh, study the sequence and to look for variant of factor H, factor I, MCP, factor B, C3, thrombomodulin, and uh, MMA, CHC. The renal biopsy is usually not required, but it can be performed in some cases to see how is the kinase. Um, we can also use uh, to predict uh, the decrease in uh, uh, Adam TS13 level, and so to distinguish TTP with HUS, we can also use the uh, creatinine level, and you can see, and the platelet level, and the presence of anti, uh, anti-nuclear antibody. And this was published uh, almost 10 years ago, known as a French score, and uh, it is uh, performed with a, a significant number of patients from the registry of uh, uh, the Centre National de Référence for Thrombotic Microangiopathy. And you can see that uh, if you mix the low creatinine lower than 200 micromolar, low platelet count lower than 30, and uh, presence of anti-nuclear antibodies, you have uh, an excellent sensitivity of the, this uh, score with uh, eight, 98% and a lower specificity. But uh, you have uh, also uh, positive and predictive, negative predictive value, which are very uh, significant. And it can be useful because sometimes the dosage of Adam TS 13 takes some time to come back. And um, it's important to know that the percentage of misclassified TTP using this score is very low, uh, below 5%. So uh, what about the renal biopsy? It is not always performed. It is uh, the marker are very well known with uh, either glomerular thrombi or arterial thrombi, as you can see here. And uh, in, uh, with fluorescence, you have fibrin deposition with the cap glomerular capillaries or in the uh, renal arterioles. But you have also some chronic lesions that we, we have to recognize without thrombi. As you can see, there is no thrombi anymore, but we have double contour of the peripheral capillary walls. We have subendothelial deposits. We have yalin deposit in arterioles and fibroantimal sickening with concentric lamination like on an skin. So there are specific signs for chronic lesions. What is important to make the diagnosis of HUS is to, we need to have uh, uh, excellent laboratories, what we have uh, in France here with the laboratory of uh, Professor Agnès Veradier for the measurement of Adam TS13 and even in some cases with the sequencing of the gene and a complement study with uh, Veronique Fremobaki. Some words about uh, malignant hypertension. You can see that it can, primary HUS can uh, induce malignant hypertension, meaning very severe hypertension with high blood, uh, diastolic blood pressure more than 120, and visceral involvement, brain, heart, kidney, and so on. And it can be associated with uh, mechanical hemolytic anemia and renal failure. And on the other hand, malignant hypertension can induce uh, a, a, a picture of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So 
it's always a difficult diagnosis in uh, adults. And uh, this is depicted here with a, a disease. You can encounter high blood pressure and the TMA is secondary to the high shear stress in small vessels. And the atypical hemolytic ischemic syndrome inducing this. And the main cause is the uh, overactivation of the alternative pathway of complement. The picture is uh, difficult to, in, uh, to separate from uh, uh, atypical HUS. Here is malignant hypertension, where you can see like nephroangiosclerosis, malignant form, with quasi occlusion of the arterioles, with the thickening of the, the wall of these arterioles, and some ischemia of the glomerulus here, and the change that can be uh, uh, seen in this uh, picture. It has been confusing also because uh, some groups, and uh, especially the group of uh, Peter van Passen uh, in Maastricht, describe some patient with hypertension-associated thrombocytic microangiopathy who had uh, a known or undiagnosed at the beginning uh, complement abnormalities and who had a special uh, evolution. And this is represented here. Six out of the nine patients, so maybe they were selected, uh, had genetic variants of the alternative pathway, but it was not known at the beginning of the disease. And it appears that some of them were transplanted. You can see here in the red bar, they are on chronic dialysis, and the blue bar. They are on, uh, after transplantation. And this one uh, did not have no recurrence on the graft, but this one had the recurrence on, on its graft. And this led to the discovery of the mutation because before it was not studied in this patient. And similarly, we have uh, in this patient the same course with the recurrence of TMA on the graft and uh, associated with. Uh, uh, complement uh, genetic variant, and this one uh, also had the two transplant with two recurrences. So uh, clearly, the diagnosis is not easy, and uh, the same group tried to identify these patients with what we call hypertensive emergency or malignant hypertension, and they perform a test which is the ex vivo C5B9 formation on the endothelium. That is uh, the uh, terminal pathway of complement. And in those with uh, massive C5B9 formation, they suspect the complement mediated TMA. They have 18 patients, and nine of these 18 had pathogenic variant on the, uh, in the complement genes, and they uh, control the blood pressure, but this was not enough. And they said that uh, they, there was a risk of recurrence after uh, renal transplantation. On the contrary, uh, those without the excess of C5 b formation, and who have probably a sheer stress-induced TMA, eight patients, known and genetic variant on the alternative pathway, and blood pressure control was very effective to prevent or to limit and to stop the uh, TMA syndrome in this patient. This test is not available everywhere. It's uh, already in the, it's, it's in the field of research, but it seems to be a promising. So what do we do in clinical setting? When we have an adult with severe or malignant hypertension and TMA, when should atypical HUS related to complement abnormality should be suspected? Of course, if, if he has personal or familial history of HUS. This is clear. Also, if there is no past history of hypertension of kidney or kidney disease in this patient, it's a de novo disease occurring recently. If he has very severe high blood pressure in a young patient, less than 40, 
especially if he's Caucasian and had renal failure. This is a bit different in a patient with a African origin because hypertension is much more frequent in this patient even before 40. There are no other causes of hypertension. Maybe the presence of glomerular microtrauma at renal biopsy is uh, important, but this is not confirmed. If we have a low C3 level, but this is not, you know, it's only 30 to 40% of the case. And if we have no improvement in platelet count or hemolysis, despite blood pressure control. So using all these arguments, we may have a, a good uh, idea. Now, can we talk about uh, the post-transplant HUS? So uh, post-transplant TMA uh, in renal transplant recipients, you know, there is a, 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 an interesting differential diagnosis. It may be the recurrence on the kidney graft of atypical HUS, or if we don't know the diagnosis on the native kidney, maybe it appears as atypical HUS de novo, but this will lead to the discovery of genetic variant. CMV infection can also induce some kind of TMA and vascular lesion. Of course, acute humoral rejection with the, the presence of donor-specific antibodies, which is uh, really a problem in, uh, in patient, in, in sensitized patient. It is also encountered in ABO incompatible transplantation that can occur also. It can be uh, the manifestation of CNI, cyclosporinate, acrolimus toxicity, but also it can be the manifestation of mTOR inhibitors like sirolimus or everolimus toxicity. Finally, don't forget that uh, transplanted patients may have stake induced HUS. Uh, this is possible. And finally, they may develop, uh, especially in case of uh, chronic rejection, severe malignant arterial hypertension. So the differential diagnosis is not easy, but in a patient with uh, previously known atypical HUS, it is the first diagnosis to evoke. And in uh, those who uh, know other causes, think about uh, the, the possibility of uh, atypical HUS with a complement variant. It is important to know it because uh, atypical HUS may recur on the graft and it uh, significantly impairs the graft outcome, as indicated here. And you can see that the long-term prognosis at five years was around 70% in this uh, retrospective study at five years without recurrence, but it was only 30% in those who had recurrence. And the risk factor for recurrence when mainly the presence of uh, genetic variant, we say variant, no, we don't say any more mutation. So the genetic variants of the complement were the main risk factor, as well as the treatment with mTOR inhibitor. The risk of recurrence is especially important in the first months of transplantation, and you can see that the risk decreases with time after transplantation, and 70% of the recurrence occur within one year of uh, transplant. And as I said before, the main risk is driven by the presence of uh, genetic variant. You can see here those with factor H mutation or uh, variant of C3 of uh, factor B with a very low survival, graph survival without recurrence, whereas those with no mutation have a graph survival which was at the time very similar to the general population. So this led to the uh, recommendation, which was uh, which were also adopted uh, in the Cadigo, uh, and I will go uh, rapidly on this. So um, now I stop here, and I I'm ready to have a question or to present a case, clinical case if you want. Thank you very much, Professor Rondo, for 
your speech very comprehensive and clear thank you so much so now uh, i encourage the audience to raise questions and by the way in the meanwhile i have received two privately so i will share now in the chat so everyone can read so the um, first one do you have a way to suspect an ad Adam TS13 deficiency before to receive the results of the biological test? Yeah, so that's an important question because uh, usually we are waiting for uh, the results of the Adam TS13. I mean, specifically in adults because in children it's less frequent, so it's more rarely the case. And so, um, as I said, the, the French score or it was also um, used a very similar plasmic score. They, they use the creatinine and the platelets at the arrival of the patient. And they are very useful because they can predict if you have less than 30,000 platelets and less than 200 micromolar um, creatinine, it's very likely, very, very likely that you will have a low uh, Adam TS13 uh, level, and you are in, in the presence of a TTP. So um, in adults, we usually um, use this score. We uh, start the plasma exchange very rapidly in many cases anyway, but uh, you know it encourages us to uh, think that it could be TTP and, and to not delay the beginning of um, of uh, plasmid changes. And uh, then uh, usually it is confirmed, but the, the percentage of misclassified uses using this uh, score is very low. So it's very useful. Thank you very much. We so, have a question from uh, Sabrina too. Yes, uh, you can unmute yourself, Sabrina, if you prefer, I've given you the right to in the chat so is shigatoxin pcr always positive in stc hs so that's also a, a big question because uh, as i said in uh, the primary atypical hs you may have uh, um, gastrointestinal signs and diarrhea and you can see if you see this patient with the uh, hs you think since he has diarrhea, that he has a stake-induced HUS. But this may not be the case. This may be that only he has uh, colitis and uh, in, in the context of uh, microangiopathy. On the other hand, we know that uh, we can repeat the PCR because uh, we have several examples of patients who had uh, gastrointestinal pain, even no more di diarrhea. But uh, the first PCR was negative, the second PCR was negative, and the third PCR was positive. So before to say that we are in the presence of uh, stack negative uh, HUS, it is important to repeat the test, especially if we have gastrointestinal signs. Thank you very much. So Sabrina, maybe now you will be able to unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Excuse me. Uh, I just want to thank you for the presentation. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, I can just present an example of a patient we had in the a clinical uh, department. So maybe it will uh, help to see the uh, question of the diagnosis of uh, HUS. Okay. We can go like this? Yes, I think it's a very good idea. Thank you. Okay. 
So uh, it's a 30 year old uh, man admitted in 2016 for AKI and uh, he had no significant personal or familial history. And recently he had a viral infection in his daughter. She was uh, three years old. And uh, he, he experienced himself fever, vomit, vomiting, diarrhea without blood, skin rash. And he, he, he lost 3.5 kilo. And uh, he went to the emergency room with the AKI and TMA, TMA but no cystocyst uh, visible at the time, normal blood pressure. And the laboratory test uh, showed that he had a renal uh, failure, proteinuria, very significant, mainly of albumin, no anemia, thrombocytopenia, normal uh, thromboplastin time, and uh, uh, increased LDH and low level of uh, aptoglobin. He had a blood culture positive for Clostridium perfringens, negative viral uh, test. And we received later Adam TS13, which was normal, the complement, uh, which was normal, and factor H, factor I, anti factor H was negative, MCP was normal. All of these were well, not obtained rapidly, but in several days after its, his uh, admission. Um, so uh, we treated first with plasmide change because it's a, a usual way we uh, manage this kind of patient waiting for different results. But you can see that it was not in agreement with the French score for TTP because he had uh, a, a, a creatinine more than 200 and a platelet count more than 30. So it was very unlikely that he had a uh, uh, Adam a certain decrease. No dialysis was required at the beginning. He received antibiotics for the, uh, the, the bacterial uh, results. And a stool analysis found E. coli enteroinvasive with uh, shigatoxin 2 STX2 gene expression and emolysin A. So uh, it was a bit surprising because he had, you know, uh, uh, positive blood culture with Clostridium and antero uh, invasive E. coli in the stool. And the PCR was positive for STX2. A renal biopsy was performed because he has heavy proteinuria, and we wonder whether he had a, a previous underlying nephropathy. And uh, we found that he had the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis with deep lesion, explaining the high proteinuria, but also mesangiolysis and double contour, which are the sign of thrombotic microangiopathy too. So he had a slow and a partial recovery of renal function. And two weeks later, he had a secondary increase in creatinine to uh, 680 with a TMA flare. Aptoglobin was undetectable. Skytocytes were present and platelet count decreased again. So we wonder whether he has still an infection with E. coli and treated with uh, azithromycin. And we ask, uh, we wonder whether we should give him uh, eculizumab because it's very unusual to have uh, two flares of uh, steak induced HUS uh, at three to four weeks of uh, uh, delay. So he was uh, vaccinated against uh, the meningococcus and received penicillin prophylaxis. And under, uh, under uh, eculizumab, which is an anti-C5, and you will have uh, more details because you have a specific uh, presentation about the treatment of uh, uh, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. He had a slow recovery of renal function, but permanent CKD with a creatinine of 200. So uh, uh, 
glomerular filtration rate of 2, uh, 32. He had no hematological sign, no flare again, and we asked for genetic testing, but you know, it's a long time to get the results. It may be two to three months. And uh, so we do not wait for genetic testing for uh, treating the patient. And the genetic testing was very surprising because uh, we found that uh, the, the patient had a, a complex variant, genetic variant on the factor H involving also the complement factor H related peptide one. So this is a schematic representation of a factor H with a 20 short consensus repeat. So these are repeated here. This area is very important for C3 convertase inhibition. And this area of factor H is very important for the binding, cell surface binding, and also to uh, binding of C3B and uh, glucosaminoglycan. And the uh, factor H related peptide one uh, has uh, quite similarity with factor H, and you can see here is also a short consensus repeat. And what happened is that some kind of recombination recombination is possible between the two genes, and in this patient, uh, the sequencing specific sequencing showed that. Actually, he had a normal allele here with factor H, CFHR3, R1, R4, and so on. And here, he has one allele with a recombination between factor H and CFHR1. So the end of the molecule of factor H, which is very important for the binding of C3B and so on, could not be uh, performed efficiently. And so it's a deficiency in the factor H. And this explains that uh, it can be uh, associated with uh, uh, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So discussion about this case, which is uh, very uh, interesting, important. It's uh, the atypical HUS. At the beginning, we asked whether it could be induced by Coxsackie infections. You know that uh, it can be induced by uh, H1N1 uh, influenza, but also we have an example with other virus. So uh, there, is, there are very, very few cases of uh, Coxsackie infection inducing HUS. So it's very unlikely. Second, we have a shigatoxin positive in this patient, and we can discuss whether the uh, gene variant on factor H could be a predisposing factor in patient infected with shiga toxin secreting E. coli. This is a discussion we can. The, the hybrid gene is very uh, is involved because we tried to stop eculizumab in this patient and he had the recurrence of the disease, so he's very sensitive and uh, he needs to have uh, the blockade of C5. So that, that's a the answer to this question, can we stop eculizumab? So when we dis discontinue eculizumab, you had the recurrence of TMA within three months. And so now you receive eculizumab every two weeks and then, then every month. And uh, in uh, recently, in June uh, 2021, so five years after the discovery of the disease, his creatinine is 215, and he has a low-level proteinuria. So now we discuss, uh, do we have other option for treatment in this patient? And uh, we are waiting for new form of uh, uh, long lasting action uh, antibodies against C5 that can be uh, maybe helpful in these patients. So now I'm done. And uh, if there is any question now, no Thank you, Professor questions. Rondo. Okay, so I guess we can end the session here. So thank you very much for having shared your expertise with us.
and um, to the audience also thank for being here and I wait for you to the next session. Thank you at all of you. Have a nice evening. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.